Um, that is one of the most, um, is one of the largest school districts in the country, and it's also one of the most diverse. And in the last 10 years, with support from the superintendent, the um, public engagement office there has engaged more than 2,000 administrators, teachers, students, and parents in dialogues about the juncture of race, ethnicity, and the so-called achievement gap. Mm -hmm. And together, they have been looking at what's happening, and they've been talking about where does this come from. White teachers have had a chance to say, how does my teaching affect, how does my implicit bias affect how I'm teaching? Principals have a chance to look at school policy to see how is it affecting, how is it playing into in terms of school discipline. Students have a chance to have a voice in what they're facing. And um, together, the school system is trying to move forward with the administrators also in the, that conversation about how do we work together to create a more equitable school system? So that's just one one little um, one little vignette, but I hope it provides some. Um, and on the sheet that went around, uh, there's there's a story of that and some of the outcomes. Hope it provides some ideas of the tools that are available, um, and it's great to be here. Great. Thank you. but also to ask each other just to share from your own experiences um, some of the, the, the challenges um, and the, the successes that you've had in sort of creating a message and building that um, the community support for it. I mean, I, I, I myself, just even listening to you for a few minutes, have a number of questions that, that I know I would like to ask and maybe I'll just start off. I mean, if we're talking about building a message and building kind of community support for this idea of the value and the importance of, of um, race, racially diverse and, and economically diverse learning environments, I mean, how do we come to an agreement about what that message is? Um, how does sort of the information that some of our research friends have access to inform that message, and how do we understand and share the legal implications of that message um, with, with our community so that um, we're not left just with anecdotal stories or just with the law that's disconnected from um, the personal experience of our parents or students, and how do we um, really inform our message um, by data and help our parents <coughs> understand what that data means? And any of you can answer. And, I mean, and by any of you, I mean all of you. Clearly, clearly, there's research out there that, that's been out there for many, many years showing the positive um, effect of, of an integrated setting in education. Um, and, and as I said, we have to continuously tell that story over and over again. At one time, I was saying that when, during, during the Civil Rights Movement, and maybe a little bit beyond, people were paying attention to those kinds of messages. These years, that message just kind of got lost. Again, I think, due to um, the economy, due to um, an increase of, in, increased racial and ethnic isolation, it keeps those barriers up so that people don't, they're not looking at it. Um, we have to continue to tell the message. We have to continue, we, we do, whether it's on, on websites or going to talk to people or talking to parents. I mean, again, I've been saying the same thing for 22 years. Um, and you would think, really, you would think that after 22 years, with all of the times that um, we've been to court in Connecticut and all the, the media we've had, people would know about Chef versus O'Neill, what it is, but they don't. They don't. So you have to just keep saying, you gotta keep saying the message over and over and over again. Um, can I just ask, because obviously I know the research, how do you say it? I'm really, because again, I know how I would say it as a lawyer, but I don't think how I say it as a lawyer is particularly useful to anyone but my law students. So I would love to hear literally what your message is, because you're very compelling, and I would just be very curious. I, I look go, go over it, go at it from the side of what is, what is education, okay? What is education? Is education just the ABCs? Is that just 
what education is about? Um, isn't there a social component to, to being in, in, in your, to your education? So it's not, it, it's not just getting your ABCs, but it's making friendships and partnerships. Like the, the guy was saying, the, um, the <coughs> superintendent was saying in the, in the um, what do you call it, plenary session. You know, I, I'm trying to get folks to understand is that when you're, if you're in this little ball and that's all you know, that's all you're going to ever know. But if you go um, and learn with people and make acquaintances with different kinds of people from different walks of life, your own um, ability, your own grasp for um, a better future is enhanced. So I try to get them to understand um, the importance of <coughs> of education and socialization as a part of education in the long term. Um, there are also studies that are meant, uh, are, are meant to show the, the negative effects of, of isolation, um, like, for instance, this school to prison pipeline that shows how, how it is highly, very possible, highly likely that if you're in a segregated poverty-ridden district that you're more likely going to go to prison than you're going to go to college. So there's all kinds of statistics, both positive and negative, out there. You just have to keep, honest to goodness, you would think, you know, it would get in. But, you know, those of us who are mothers in the room, how many times do you have to say, can you pick your socks up? Can you pick your socks up? That, that's the sort of the, the same, you just got to keep telling the message over and over again. Yes. Hi, my name is Pauline Williams. I'm a parent of two children that went through Craig Magnet School since they were three years old. And I want to ask you, Elizabeth, again, what challenges and obstacles do you see that our students are facing now that they didn't face 22 years ago? And do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? Are you optimistic about our children's future? You know, I believe... I, you know, I believe in all, all things are possible because I, you know, I believe in God. For those of you in the room who are inclined, um, share with me. For those of you who are not, bear with me. Okay. Um, uh, our children face a lack of respect for education. And I think that's partly our fault. Okay. I don't. I think that not our you and me. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about our society. Um, has, I, re, I don't really think we place the kind of value on education as we, as we once did. Um, our children face um, racism in our schools that thwarts their ability to thrive. Um, they face, I think, which is even worse than racism, internalized racism where the society has told them for so long, you can't do it, you're not good enough, they believe it. That goes to that, um, you're acting white stuff. Mm -hmm. um, people look at me, they ask me what kind of music, you like white music, Elizabeth. What, what, is, what is white music? I mean, so I mean, if you, if you ask our kids, um, they have a really rough time. They have it much. They have it much more difficult than we than we had it when we were growing up. I mean, we had a we had a society that supported education, <coughs> and therefore the fallout was even across the board. We education was important. Now education is becoming a back burner issue for America, and I I cannot help but wonder how much of that is the direct result of the fact that more and more the children that are in American schools are children of color. How much of, how much of this placing education on the back burner is a direct, has a direct correlation to that? I'd like to add to the statistics that you Um, and even more specifically, 
in the moment right now <coughs> there's something major that's happening. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they have played Saturday Food Revolution Day. And it's sort of like National Night Out where different localities around the country can support that. <coughs> so in, in the coalition that I'm working with, I have a degree in Administration of Justice and Public Safety, which is a focus on juvenile justice. And I think now, you know, I'm working on gaps in service delivery, where I am an academic proponent. I'm also an experienced credentialing proponent as well, and how you really get people that live in stagnant poverty yeah. to really grasp their reality mm -hmm. and share that reality with service providers who start off wanting to do good things, but by the nature of attractions, mm -hmm. whatever that word really is, we, we come up against just sometimes insurmountable emotional challenges. You know, and then you react all over the place. So I just want to, you know, share that, you know, you have to create an environment where there's no dumb question. Exactly. You know, my father mm -hmm. would tell me all the time, he who asks the question is fool for the moment, but he who never asks the question is fool forevermore. You know, so and then that repetition stuff of really talking with folk who really don't have uh, reality beyond 20 or 25 years old is really very impactful in a high concentrated poverty situation. I sit on a leadership council for a race reconciliation initiative where we will be actually doing some of this tomorrow. Tomorrow morning we'll be talking about education, uh, transportation, housing, and workforce development from a grassroots perspective and from a policy perspective. Mm -hmm. And I'll be speaking from the grassroots perspective. And in that, it's like, you know, how do you, it's, it's very, it's a high burnout. Rate. And I know we all know that process. But like you were saying, you know, I believe in the God that sits high and look low. Amen. You know, and, and we just have to keep on moving forward. But in this food revolution thing, and the young lady is really, really nice. But what has happened? And if I was a different person under different circumstances, she'd be cussed out by right now. <laughs> you know? But in trying to build a multifaceted coalition of people where different people's life experiences are respected, honored, treasured, and implemented, if it makes sense. You know, I get tired of well-meaning people and I've only been in public housing since 2004, but an advocate for 20 or 30 years as well. But you see a whole different perspective of stop and start, stop and start. Mm -hmm. And that leads to the apathy. Yeah. So we have to really dig down deep with this great opportunity now of moving forward because we had, you look at 100 people, back in the day, it might be five people that was really telling the truth all the time. Yeah. I think now we really have a swing of about 45 to maybe 60 people out of 100 that really want to listen to the truth mm -hmm. and can respond to the truth. Mm -hmm. But you got to get that information out there repetitiously. <coughs> but what this young lady did was, when I started pushing back on her information and who she was bringing to the forefront of being able to help promote this urban garden of healthy nutritional stuff in the poor community, she had already had her people lined up. So she didn't want, and, and the sad part is, is you have black folks that have the same credentials as white folks, mm -hmm. and you have white people that keep trying to put their persons into job paying positions, and black folks are volunteers and we're having focus groups, and that causes dissension in the community. So, you know, you know the story out of that, but anyway, you know, so she stopped with me. She went over to another partner of mine. She stopped with her because I found out the information. We're talking about over the course of 10 days. And the event is Saturday. And, you know, so I'm going to, you know, do my debrief after the event. So just, you know, stuff like that. And I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, from this complimentary process and how you respect people from all viewpoints to really look at the whole collective of the neighborhood, if that's really what you're trying to do. 
you know, D-Ball on the 7th of the month, 